So, uh, Simon and Thomas, <coughs> excuse me, and Alexander all um, suggested various things that I could explain in some kind of introduction to coherent sheaves, and uh, they amounted to about an eight lecture course, and I have two lectures, so uh, I'm going to randomly do, just do some introduction in this lecture, and then maybe, I mean, I know one thing I can talk about in the second lecture, but if people have strong views or preferences or something, then let me know, um, and I can cover that in the second lecture instead. So, uh, I guess most of you know, um, uh, in higher dimensional gauge theory, you have all these problems with compactification and transversality of moduli spaces. Um, in algebraic geometry, a vastly superior subject, we don't have any of these problems. Um, but of course, that's because we solve a much weaker problem. Uh, but um, the model, the, the way the problem is solved in algebraic geometry often gives a model for what the differential geometry might look like. Uh, so I guess that's the motivation for studying these things if you're a differential geometer. So um, throughout this talk, X will be some kind of complex manifold um, or algebraic variety if you prefer. And then OX, you shouldn't be intimidated by the notation, although it isn't intimidating. Uh, this is the sheaf of appropriate functions on X. So um, if X is a complex manifold, this is the sheaf of holomorphic functions on X. And that's probably the language I'll mainly use. Or if this was an algebraic variety, this would be the sheaf of regular functions, or so quotients of polynomials, which uh, have no poles. Okay. And um, why are we taking sheaves? So in differential geometry, you can take I don't know um, a space and some class of smooth functions or continuous functions, and that determines the global functions determine the space because you've got lots of them. That's not the case in algebraic geometry. You have lots of functions locally, but not enough globally. They don't extend to global functions. There's no partitions of unity. So you have to study things locally. So that's why you have to use sheaves. So instead of just looking at the global functions on x, there would only be the constant ones if x was compact, you look at functions locally. So that's why you need a sheaf. A sheaf is to every open set. Uh, there's a risky open if I'm doing algebraic geometry or just regular, normal Euclidean open if I'm doing complex geometry. Um, to every open set, I assign all the holomorphic functions on that open set. That's what this sheaf is, okay? So it's just a local version of functions. And then I can talk about, well, the, the first thing to understand is you might be interested in holomorphic or algebraic vector bundles on X. And these are the same thing as locally free sheaves of OX modules. Okay, so what does that mean? So if you have a holomorphic vector bundle on X, the way an algebraic geometer tends to think about it is via its sheaf of sections. So again, if you're in differential geometry, the global smooth sections of E as a module over all the functions on X determines E. But here we don't have lots of global sections, we only have local sections. So we do things locally with sheaves and so what we do is we assign to a vector bundle the sheaf of sections of that vector bundle. So over any open set, we take all the sections of that vector bundle over the open set. And where E is trivial, so if E restricted to U is just sort of C to the R times U holomorphically, then over here what you get is that um, the sheaf, let me call it E of U, is just R copies of the functions on U. Okay. So associated with the vector bundle, I get a sheaf, which I denote by the same letter because they're equivalent information. And over the open set, what's the sheaf of sections of this vector bundle? Well, because the vector bundle's trivial over this open set, then um, it's just R copies of the functions. Okay. So that's locally free. This is a free OX module. It's just R copies of OX. Okay, so it's locally, it's a free module. And then globally, uh, how do we go back? We just take transition functions. Okay, so if you have a locally free sheaf of OX modules, sorry, this, what does an OX module mean? This means there's an action of OX. It means I can multiply sections, holomorphic sections, by holomorphic functions in the obvious way. Okay, 
So that's why everything's an OX module, because I can always multiply by functions. And the way we go back is we say, if we have uh, a locally free sheaf, then locally over an open cover, it always looks trivial. And between any two patches, there's a way of gluing from one to the other, because they're isomorphic over the patch. And that gluing will be a, U, a GLR valued function over U, but it'll be holomorphic. And that's what I use in my transition function to create my vector model. Okay, so these are the same data. All right. Any questions? All right. So then, uh, definition: a coherent sheaf on X is just the quotient of two vector bundles, essentially. Is an OX module, a sheaf of OX modules. Uh, which is locally, and if you're in the projective case, or in a good case, that's more or less the same as globally, but it's locally, uh, the quotient of two locally free sheaves. Okay, so it's... <coughs> so let me call this curly E. Uh, maybe I'll call these E0, E1. All right, so, so I have two of these objects, and then I have a, a map between them. Well, that's just the same thing as a map of holomorphic vector bundles, so a holomorphic map between two vector bundles, but of course its rank can drop. Okay, so it's not, if it had constant rank, then the quotient would also be a vector bundle or a locally free sheaf, but because the rank can drop, uh, then we end up getting more interesting information. Okay, so I'll give a ton of examples in a minute. Uh, yeah, so if it's projective, for instance, you can, yeah, or, yeah, Stein, or if you have cohomology vanishing, some way of getting cohomology vanishing. Okay. And then just as an aside, the kernel of this map of sheaves is also coherent, so is also the quotient. Um, of a locally free sheaf. Okay, so I can take the kernel here, I can subject onto it by a locally free sheaf, and then I can iterate. I can take the kernel of that map and subject onto it by a locally free sheaf and so on. Okay, so I get resolutions, you know, like this. Okay, so this is an exact sequence of sheaves. Anything in the kernel of one map is in the image of the previous, and so on. Okay. And at each stage, when I take this kernel, so if this is a particularly nasty sheaf, there are definite measures of nastiness, like homological dimension, or lengths of locally free resolutions. But at each stage, when I pass to the kernel of some map like this, the sheaf improves and gets better and better and less singular. Okay. And so you can prove, actually, that so long as x is smooth, this is finite. Eventually, I can get to some stage, and when I take the kernel, it'll be locally free itself. So I don't need to go any further. Okay, so eventually I get this. So that's what locally free sheaves look like. Yeah, these are, these are just maps of vector bundles, so holomorphic maps of vector bundles. Yeah. So lo locally, they're just like, like matrices of holomorphic functions. Right, another way. OK, so you can think of these as singular holomorphic vector bundles. We'll give ex I'll give you examples in a minute to show you instances of that. But I just want to tell you why this is a good notion. I mean, you could have come up with some other notion. And, and where this word coherence comes from. So what's good about this is that point, nearby points talk to each other. So in the sheaf, 
the behavior of sections of the sheaf at one point talk to nearby points. That's what the coherence is about. So if you think of, um, you're familiar with that with vector bundles, but if I map a vector bundles, if it's onto at a point, then it's onto in a neighborhood of that point. Okay? And if it just has rank R at a point, then in the neighborhood of that point, it has rank at least R. The rank can only go up as you deform away. All right? And the same, exactly the same thing is true of these coherent sheets. Okay. So that's called the Nakayama lemma. So in order to explain that, I have to tell you what it means to say how it behaves at a point. Usually when you have a sheaf, it doesn't make sense to talk about the fiber at a point. It's not like a vector bundle. All you can talk about is the germ at a point, the germ of sections at a point. Okay? But because these are OX modules, there's a notion of fiber at a point. And what is it? It's E restricted to P is defined to be, if you take the sheaf of sections of E and you divide by this, okay, where IP, this is the ideal sheaf of holomorphic functions vanishing at P. Okay? So you multiply your sheaf by functions which vanish at P, and you divide by all of those, and this gives you this fiber at the point P. Okay? So this only works because it's an OX module. So usually sheaves wouldn't have a notion of fiber. When you have a vector bundle, a locally free sheaf, this is the fiber you expect of the vector bundle. Um, and because, yeah, because we have OX modules, this makes sense, so we can talk about this. So this is special to OX, fi, uh, sheaves of OX modules. And then we have the Nakayama lemma. which looks kind of harmless. It says if the fiber at P is zero, then the sheaf is zero in some neighborhood, some open set, U of P. All right? So uh, exercise, think of a sheaf of OX modules which doesn't have this property. It's very easy to come up with such a sheaf. Okay, but coherent sheaves have this, this property, which vector bundles also have. Right. And so if you apply this to the co-kernel of some map of sheaves, so sorry, straight letters will always be vector bundles because they're simple objects, and then curly letters mean that they're complicated objects, so they're sheaves. Okay, so if we apply this to the co-kernel, what you find is that the, if the co-kernel at a point is zero, so if it's onto at a point, then it's onto in a neighborhood of a point. Okay, so this says that, um, that phi is onto at P on the fibers implies that phi is locally onto in a neighborhood. Okay, and more generally, the, the rank of a map, you can use this to show the rank of a map of coherent sheaves always goes up in a neighborhood, okay? So it's uh, upper semi-continuous. Any questions? So this is more or less the reason. This means coherent sheaves behave extremely manageably and extremely well, okay? So they're, they're a good sort of notion of singular vector bundle. And you're sort of forced to have them. If you study vector bundles and maps between vector bundles, you obviously want to be able to take co-kernels, so you end up with these sheaves here. Okay, you don't want to only consider maps between vector bundles which have constant rank. Okay, so let's do some examples. So we've done locally free sheaves. At the other extreme, we have these sort of Dirac deltas. So I could take the structure sheaf of a point. Okay, so if I have P and X, this is the sheaf which to an open set U assigns uh, C if P is in U and zero otherwise. Okay, so then you should think of this as a direct delta at the point P. So this is a sheaf just concentrated at P. And more generally, um, if I have Z is some subvariety of X, then I can talk about the direct delta on Z. So this sends U to 
uh, the functions on u intersect z. Is just the same as this, this guy, okay? So what you should think of is this is a, the trivial line bundle on z pushed forward to x. So it's zero everywhere else, but you have this trivial line bundle supported on z. Okay, and more generally, if E is any sheaf on Z, E, uh, yes, I guess that's right. A closed subvariety. Yeah, otherwise you'd be, you, it wouldn't be coherent. Okay, let me call this inclusion iota. Then more generally, I can take iota star of E. And what's this sheaf? This is the sheaf which sends any open set in X to the sheaf of sections on U intersect Z. Okay, but it's just what you would think it is, okay? It's the sheaf which is zero everywhere outside Z, and along Z it's E. Okay, so if E was a vector bundle, you should think of this as a vector bundle on Z and nothing outside Z. All right, maybe more interesting, these are all things called torsion sheaves. So these are all torsion, and why is that? They're killed by functions which vanish on Z. This I always stands for ideal sheaf of functions vanishing somewhere. Just as up here, these are the functions that vanish at P. These are the functions vanishing on Z. So these are killed by lots of functions, so that's, they're called torsion sheaves. And usually you wouldn't see them in gauge theory, I think. Although they're certainly useful in gauge theory. Okay, but now some torsion-free sheaves. So a good example are these uh, ideal sheaves. These are also, IZ is also a coherent sheaf. Okay, so this is, this is to an open set. I just take the functions in that open set which vanish along Z. So let me give you an example of that. So e.g., if I take the origin in C2, and I'm taking, uh, let's say, algebraic functions on C2, then the ideal sheaf of the origin is usually written this way. So it's, it's generated by two elements, two functions, x and y, with the obvious relations between them that, you know, y times this x is x times this y. All right, and this is not a locally free sheaf, so this has two generators at the origin. Away from the origin, it just looks like functions on C2, so it only has one generator. So this is why you see it's not locally free. And uh, so let me show you why it's coherent. So I need two generators, so I want to see it as a quotient of a locally free sheaf, so I'm gonna need a rank two locally free sheaf because it has two generators. So what I do is I take two copies of the functions on C2, and I map them to I0 by the first function gets multiplied by X, and the second function gets multiplied by Y, and then I add them up and I end up in here. And this is a surjection, and this shows it's a coherent sheaf. And then what's the kernel? Maybe I'll just do that. I'll rub this off in a second. What's the kernel of that map? Well, so I take an element here, so it could be f comma g, and if it's in the kernel, then I get x f plus y g equals zero. All right, but what does this say? So x f is minus y g. Okay, so in particular, you see that f is divisible by y because x is not, okay? So y divides f, and similarly x divides g, all right? So if I write f is y times big F, and g is x times, well, what's it gonna be? It may be big G, but when you plug it back into here, you'll see that big G has to be minus f, okay? So you end up with this. Okay, so the kernel is generated by things of the form y times one fixed thing, and minus x times the same fixed thing. Okay, so what does that tell me here? That tells me that the kernel is generated by one, it has one generator, that's this f, and 
I map it to here by in the opposite way. So the first one is y now instead of x, and the second one is minus x. All right, and then you can check the kernel of that map is zero. All right, that's obvious. This can never be zero. Zero function. It can vanish. I, uh, maybe I should have made this clearer. It can vanish at points, but as a section, it can never be zero. In a low, because we're dealing with sheaves, we're interested in how their behavior over open sets. So over open set, this is never zero. All right. So as a map of sheaves, rather than say a map of vector spaces or something, it's never zero. Okay, so we get this resolution here. Okay, so I'm going to leave that on the board because it will come up later. This is called the Kazul resolution. Any questions about this? Is the finiteness of the resolution part of your definition? No. Uh, the, the finiteness of this index is part of the definition. So, but not, not the, yeah, it's a theorem that actually eventually it becomes finite. The syzygy theorem. So if you want this to be infinity, then you have to say quasi-coherent sheets. Questions? And maybe I'll just show, show what, it's easy to see you can't do any better. You can't see this, this really isn't locally free. Even though it's rank one away from the origin, it really is rank two at the origin. So one way to see that is to look at its fiber at the origin. So its fiber at zero is, what is it? It's I zero divided by and then I'm supposed to multiply by all functions which vanish at the origin times by my sheaf. Right. And so you see that this is sort of x, y divided by all quadratic functions and higher. Sorry, this is an ideal. I don't know how good your algebra is. Uh, this is the ideal generated by x and y means any function times x plus any function times y. Okay. And then when we multiply by x and y again, we, get, we divide out by the quadratic piece. And so we end up just with a linear space spanned by x and y. And so really, it's the cotangent space to my space C2 at the origin. OK, and I'm just seeing the linear part in the Taylor expansion. OK, so this, this has dimension 2. So this is not locally free. Okay, because the exercise, you can check that the fiber at any other point is, has dimension 1. All right, and, and these are the things we'll see briefly later. These are the things which sort of give you the bubbles in Donaldson theory and these co-dimension, real co-dimension 4 singularities that you see in gauge theory. How do you see it's torsion free? Uh, because it lives in some th side something torsion free. You see, it lives inside O of C2. Uh, so it can't possibly have any torsion because this is torsion free. Why is this torsion free? Well, I mean, it's free. It's free. <laughs> yeah. But then it's still a theorem that it's torsion free. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so any function, it, it's, it's a property of the polynomials. Well, it depends which category you work in, but it's... Anyway, let's work algebraically. It's a po property of the polynomials. So this is a torsion-free ring. Like, there are, there are no uh, zero divisors in this ring. So there are no functions. There are no polynomials, which when you multiply by another polynomial, you get zero. Okay? So if f times g equals zero, then f equals zero or g equals zero. What does this mean? A unique factorization domain or something? Is that correct? No. I'm not sure that's helpful. Yeah, Certainly not to me. Integral to me. Okay. Right. 
so to get more examples, what I want to do is relate these sheaves to sub-varieties. So um, if you have a co-dimension R sheaf, uh, sorry, co-dimension R sub-variety, you might hope it's cut out by a section of a rank R vector bundle. Okay, so we, that's sort of where we're going, but we'll start with co-dimension one. Okay, so this is sort of sub-varieties and vector bundles. So this sort of co-dimension R here will go to rank R here. Okay, so we start with R equals one. All right, so if D, D and X is a divisor, that means it's co-dimension one. All right, and because I'm always assuming X is smooth, then it, it's really, it's cut out locally by one equation. So that means it's something called a Cartier divisor. Um, if X isn't smooth, then you need to make that as an assumption. Okay, so it's cut out by one holomorphic equation locally. Okay, then what does that mean? Then the ideal sheaf of functions vanishing on D is rank one locally free. So this is kind of surprising the first time you see it, I think. And why is that? Is that because locally, uh, if D, you know, in U, let's say, if D is given by one equation, F equals zero, then any function in I of D is divisible by F, is H dot F for some unique H. All right. So you see, so O, so I of D, locally, is, you know, mul after multiplication by F, it is O of X. Okay. So any function, I of D, just looks like the functions, H. These functions H. Okay. When you divide by F, you just get functions. Conversely, when you have functions, you multiply them by F. You get elements of this. Maybe, you know, I'm not sure if we want that F. But anyway, locally, it just looks like OX, okay? So I of D is a line bundle. Corresponds to a line bundle. Because it's a locally free sheaf of rank one. So what is that line bundle? And it's not a trivial line bundle. So if I have an open cover of X, and in that open cover I pick, so pick such that uh, Fi equals zero is D in Ui. Okay, so I just pick over my open cover, I pick a bunch of functions. I make it fine enough so that I can pick a bunch of functions which cut out D. then uh, I can work out the transition functions of this sheaf, this, this uh, line bundle here. So uh, the section of I of D given by, well, it might look like, um, uh, what was I calling it, H? It might look like Fi times H in Ui. Then what does that look like in Uj? Well, it's the function fi times h. I need to write it as fj times something. So this is fj times by uh, fi fj inverse h. All right. So in my trivialization, remember the way I was trivializing this line bundle, if I, if I think of it as locally trivial, locally as just the functions, that was by dividing by this fi. So over here, so in the, in the trivializations of id, looking locally over each ui, like o, what this is, it says that the function h in ox corresponds over here to the function fi fj inverse h. All right? So that's how the trivializations patch together. Okay, so the transition functions you know, from ui to uj over the overlap, sorry, this is over ui intersect j. Okay. 
the transition functions are this fi fj inverse. So now you have a line bundle. How do I do this? Sorry. Do you have better boards than this in Bath, Mark? Has your life improved significantly? <laughs> Clear. Couldn't be cleaner than this. So was anyone here when Brian Conrad came and gave a lecture? He got so upset about the, the boards being so dirty that he produced some like ethanol or something and then his own pens. And so he got it all spotless. And then, of course, he used an old board rubber. And he went, <laughs> it just turned black. And he was so upset. He basically abandoned his own lecture. Uh, sorry, can everyone? I guess you can't see that. <coughs> but uh, we also have, so I of D, of course, maps to O of X. So the functions vanishing on D sit inside the functions, all functions on X. Okay? So here's a map of a line bundle to O X. So what does that correspond to? It corresponds to a section of the dual line bundle. Okay, so this is a section of the dual line bundle. So ID dual. So these are these are sort of the local. This is Homs uh, OX linear Homs from ID to OX. Okay. So Homs from this sheaf to this sheaf which commute with multiplication by the functions. Okay, but it's just the usual, as a vector bundle, it's the usual notion of dual. Okay, this just dualizes all the fibers. And you can see this vanishes on D. Let me change pens. Okay, why is that? Because locally, um, it takes the generator 1 in the trivialization of this line bundle here. What does it take it to? Well, remember, how did I trivialize it? I trivialized by dividing by the function which vanishes on D, which was some fi, right? So 1, the generator 1 of this locally rank one locally free sheaf corresponds to the function fi, right? So it takes one over here to fi, which vanishes on d. Only in the fiber sense, not in the sheaf sense, right? No, if I look at this in any open set containing a point of d, this fi is never zero section, but it does drop rank on d. Okay, and this is the dual line bundle. This has transition functions. The opposite of these. So here it was fi, fj inverse. So this is fj, fi inverse. And notice these take fi on ui to fj, if I multiply by this, on uj. Okay? So the fi's glue to define the section. Okay, and that's this section here. So let me call this section SD, S sub D. So this is the section of this line bundle which vanishes on D. And this is precisely this section. I've just described it locally and I've checked it glues. All right, so the data is, so we, we call this line bundle we tend to call this O of D, okay? 
and it has this section SD, this canonical section. All right, so it's a line bundle with a section vanishing on the divisor, and we tend to call this, uh, we call this, it's dual, we call it O of minus D. All right, and this has a section, this has a meromorphic section, which, with a pole on D. All right. And how do you see that? That's actually even easier to see than the original one. It's the section, um, so if we have I of D inside O of X, then we have the section 1 here. There's a canonical section. And what does that look like back here? Well, it's meromorphic, because if you, if you work in a little open set where D is given by F equals 0, then this section 1 here, back in the trivialization, looks like 1 over F. All right? So you can see it blows up on D. It's not really defined on D. All right? So there's this canonical section. There's a canonical meromorphic section of this, given by 1. Okay. Now, I'm going to put the book on. Thank you. Say again? So OD is, yeah, this ID dualized. Yeah. Okay, so uh, completely trivially, suppose my. So if I have a curve, so x is some curve. There you go, there's a curve. And uh, my divisor is a point. Or I'm even allowed to take sort of n times a point where n is some, in, in, uh, let's say, natural number for safety. OK, then what does this mean, this whole construction? Well, it means I'm supposed to take an open set around the point. There's a good picture of a risky open set. Um, and I'm supposed to say, well, locally, what does my n times a point look like? It looks like, so if I choose a local coordinate here, this looks like it might be z vanishing at p. Then I would take the, the coordinate z to the n. That vanishes on sort of n times p. It vanishes at p to order n. OK, but if you're unhappy, just take n equals 1. OK, so I have the local function z here on u. On v, what function shall I pick? Cutting out this divisor, I may as well pick 1. And then what glues them together over the overlap? Think of it as just this circle. Really, it's an annulus. OK, what glues them together is the transition function, z to the n, OK, from the circle or the, or the annulus to c star, which is the GL1, the, uh, what we patch together line bundles with. OK, and this has degree. You can see this is non-trivial. This has a uh, winding number n, which is the first churn class of this line bundle, O of d. Okay. So you, you really see you get non-trivial line bundles in this way, but non-trivial topology. Uh, yeah, well, uh, b instead of going from u to v, you go from v to u, or, yeah, I didn't follow, yeah. Okay. You can have z to the minus n if you prefer, yeah. I didn't keep track of signs. Right. Now, I was going to leave up my causal resolution, but I failed to do so, didn't I? Never mind. Um, shall I put this down if people want to see it? Or up higher. Okay, so that, that's the case of co-dimension one subvarieties. They always correspond to line bundles, a unique line bundle, and they're then cut out by a section of that line bundle. So let's now, and then there's a, there's a story, but it gets more and more complicated in all 
co-dimensions, but I'm just going to concentrate on co-dimension 2. All right, so I'm going to say Z in X is co-dimension 2, and it's something called a local complete intersection, which means it's locally uh, the zeros of two holomorphic functions. Okay, but uh, smooth, e.g., so you can ignore that. So e.g., smooth. Okay, so we've done examples of this before. There's the origin in C2. And uh, I gave you a resolution of the ideal sheaf in that case. And um, I'm going to do a much more general version of it now. Okay. So, um, so this is a digression. Is suppose I have a, an element of a vector space, okay, which is non-zero. All right, then I get a, an exact sequence. Wedging with this vector gives me a map from C to this vector space, and then I can wedge again, and the composition will be zero, because wedge with V squared is obviously zero. V wedge V is zero. I go to wedge two of V, and then wedge three of V, and so on. And this terminates. And this is exact. Does everyone agree? If you're, if when I, if I take a differential form and I wedge with a vector, I get zero. That's because there was already a v in it, so it was already v wedge something. Okay. Now, if I do this in families, so what I'm going to do, so I sort of globalize this. What I'm going to do is take a s is now a section of a holomorphic vector bundle E. So I'm going to do a family version of this. Okay, then I can do and so on. Okay. And then if E has rank R, then it ends here. And the amazing thing is, so where S doesn't vanish, this is exact, essentially because of this and Nakayama lemma. So at a point, it's exact. And then the Nakayama lemma tell you it's exact locally on sections. Um, but amazingly, S can still vanish. So if S vanishes, if S vanishes, but it vanishes in some sense slightly transversely. And the algebraic geometry's version of transversely is just this condition, OK? S vanishes, and Z, which is the zeros of S, has co-dimension R. All right? So locally, S looks like R functions. And if those functions are somewhat transverse, they actually don't need to be completely transverse in the differential geometry sense. But all you need to know is that each one cuts down the dimension by one. So this Z could be hopelessly singular. So these S needn't be transverse. But so long as it has co-dimension R, then it will be LCI. Almost by definition, it's locally the zeros of R holomorphic functions. OK, then a local computation shows this is exact. Uh, not quite. Let me remove that bit. But it can't be quite exact at the end, look, because I wedged with S, and S vanishes on Z. So what possible, you know, wedge R is just a line bundle. So let's assume this is just the functions. When I take something which is wedge S, then obviously I'm only going to get functions with sort of an S in them. They're all going to vanish on Z. So actually what you get here is the ideal sheaf of Z. This is exact, and it's called the causal resolution of 
IZ, really tensor with this line bundle. But we can dualize it. Okay, or duly. What's that? No, only the last one. That's right. So uh, let, let me explain that in a second. So, uh, but duly, we, we can take the dual of this, just as you can take the dual up here. You can work with the dual vector spaces and just contract with S instead. So duly, I get 0 goes to wedge R E dual, goes via contraction with S, wedge R minus 1 E dual, all down to here, here. Okay. And then when I contract with S, I get functions which vanish on Z. Okay, this is really, this is probably what people call the Kozol evolution. All right. So uh, you might struggle to believe me initially that this would be exact in the middle here near the zeros of S on Z. But we already did this, and I rubbed it off the board, uh, which was, do you remember we had this O, uh, zero goes to O, goes to, on C2, and we had the origin in C2, and we had the ideal sheet. We had this here, and this was Y minus X. This was X, Y. Okay? And this is precisely an example of this. Okay? So it turns, it turns out it is true. Well, Z is defined to be, yeah, so uh, that's right. So Z is a scheme in that case, and then it is the idea. So we just redefine the terminology until it's correct. Don't worry about <laughs> that. Don't, don't worry about that. We just give things a more complicated name, and then everything becomes true. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't worry about that. Uh, let's presume, Z, let's assume Z smooth. All right, so... Um, this is an example of that. It's this amazing fact that if you take something at the middle, when you wedge with S, which vanishes on Z, if you're in the kernel of that, you already yourself vanish on Z, and you're in the image of wedging with S. It was just this example here where it said, if we go to zero here, so X times F plus Y times G equals zero, you see that F and G themselves vanish. They're divisible by X and Y. And so we, we come back from back here. Okay, so it turns out this is a, a locally free resolution of uh, this sheet. Okay? Any questions? So th this is how all of sheet theory is done, is essentially with this, or variants and more complicated versions. So when you say you start with this section being locally complete, it's a section, and now you kind of use the fact that the two-volumorphic function is not somehow always No, sorry, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm going to go back to that, sorry. What I'm doing is I'm starting with a section of a vector bundle vanishing on Z. Okay, so and now I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to say, given Z, can I get this data? Sorry, I didn't explain that very well. Right. This is co-dimension R. Absolutely, yeah. And then this would not be an exact sequence. Yes. Yeah, I may not have stated my uh, assumptions too well there. Okay, but now I'm going to try and go backwards. So I'm going to say, suppose my Z locally looks like it's cut out by two functions. Can I reconstruct a rank two bundle with a section cutting out my Z? Okay, so the, the sort of the inverse problem. Okay, you start with Z in X, co-dimension 2, maybe local complete intersection or smooth. Okay, can we construct E, rank 2, with a section S, uh, such that the zeros of S are Z in the scheme theoretic sense, but let, let's not worry about that. Okay. I.e., can we form a causal resolution of 
this form of I z. Now note, so maybe an aside, if we can, then there's something called a junction, which says that E restricted to Z is the normal bundle to Z. Right, so maybe I draw a picture. Here's my Z, clearly co-dimension 2, and here's my vector bundle with a section cutting it out. Right. And the derivative of the section gives you an isomorphism. The graph of the derivative, so take the, take the Taylor set. Oh, I've got to make it look rather flat there. But. There we go. Uh, the derivative gives me an isomorphism. The graph of the derivative gives me an isomorphism from the normal bundle to Z through this graph up to E restricted to Z. Sorry? Z is this, this point here, this co-dimension 2 point. Uh, this is a per you can't criticize this picture. It's absolutely <laughs> perfect. <laughs> All right. The derivative, so that via the derivative of S restricted to Z. All right. So if I go along Z, the derivative is 0. So it, this map passes, it's not just from the tangent space of x, it really passes to the quotient by t of z. So it passes to the normal bundle, and it gives me an isomorphism to e restricted to z. Okay. So in particular, wedge 2 of the normal bundle of z dual is isomorphic to wedge 2 e restricted to z dual. Okay. okay. So, the line bundle on Z, given by wedge 2 and the normal bundle, the determinants of the normal, dual normal bundle, okay, co-normal bundle, uh, extends to X as this guy. All right? And we don't have a good criterion for this. Well, this is the kind of thing that can be studied separately, but I'm not going to study this problem today of when does a line bundle on a subvariety extend to the whole variety, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to start with this as an assumption, okay? So the SAIR construction you start with Z in X and you assume wedge 2, the normal bundle of Z, this line bundle here extends to a line bundle, there may be many, L on X. That's, that's an easier problem, so we're going to ignore that for now. Right. I'll give an example, maybe I'll run out of time, I'll give the example next time, where, it, you know, this is a trivial problem. I'll take like a line in P3 or something, and we understand the line bundles on the line and the line bundles on P3, and we can see they all extend. So now I want a condition. I want to form an extension of sheaves star this causal resolution so to produce e okay so i want to i want to say i have naught goes to l goes to this thing here which i'm going to call e goes to iz goes to zero i want to find e Okay. And then when I've done that, I've found all the data. This map here defines me the section of the dual of E. My E's changed to E dual, never mind. All right? 
everyone see what I'm doing? So I have these sheaves, and I want to form some kind of extension, and that'll be my rank two vector bundle with a section cutting out z. And Sayer solves this problem. So tell me the answer. Let me tell you the answer. So away from z, uh, this is an extension. Oh, now I always get this wrong. Is it from? Is it fr an extension from this one to this one? Is that correct? Yeah. So there's an extension from O x to L. You see, away from z, this is just the functions on x. This is just a an exact sequence of vector bundles. Yes, an extension or of, of O x by L. Maybe that's better. Okay, so these are classified by H one on, I guess x take z of uh, the maps from here to here. Okay, and I'll, I'll say in a Dolbo sense, so this is maybe more easily described in a check cohomology way, but for the purposes of what I'm about to say, it's more convenient to describe the Dolbo representative. All right, so what is it? It's so you say, well, um, topologically, it, if you were doing differential geometry, you have an extension of two vector bundles where it just splits, right? You can pick a Hermitian metric or something and just split it by orthogonal complements. You can't do that in holomorphic world because that's not holomorphic. Hermitian metrics involve complex conjugates, okay? So, but topologically it's split, so it just looks like OX plus L, okay? And the, everything's described by the D-bar operator. Okay, so all these holomorphic sections are just the kernel of the D-bar operator. A holomorphic vector bundle is just um, defined as a smooth vector bundle with a D-bar operator. Okay, that defines the holomorphic structure. Okay, and so the D-bar operator looks like it's just the usual D-bar operator on OX. The D-bar operator defining the holomorphic structure on L. Okay, now L is a subsheaf. So if I take a holomorphic section of L, it must be holomorphic in E, which means that uh, there must be a zero there, okay? Like, there can't be, if I take a section of L and I operate it on it by this, I only care whether it's holomorphic in L as to whether it's holomorphic in E. But this can be non-zero here, so I can put some sigma here, okay? So that means that I, this, this piece is not a subsheaf. It needn't be, there needn't be a holomorphic map back, okay? So in my topological splitting, okay? So this sigma here is in H1 uh, from this piece to this piece, okay? So it's a, so D bar sigma is zero, okay? So this is my D bar operator, so my D bar operator looks like D bar plus D bar L plus sigma, where sigma is a zero one four with values in L, all right? Now, the condition uh, that this extension extends over Z, okay, well, it could extend over Z in a trivial way. I could just take the direct sum of L plus IZ. That would be rubbish because that's not a vector bundle. That's not locally free, okay? But to give something locally free, is that you can work it out globally, uh, locally, it's that d bar of sigma is the Dirac delta along z. All right, sorry, I've kind of run out of time. So let me just finish, finish off quickly. Equivalently, so, so I need to define this in sort of omega zero two. So equivalently, if I'm using Dolbo cohomology with on currents, so what I'm trying to say is that Z defines a class 
in H2 of the line bundle, and this should be zero because it's D bar of something, okay? The Dirac delta of Z in H2 L is zero, okay? If that's the case, then I can find this sigma. It extends over Z, gives me a locally free resolution, okay? And so what is this class? I just tell you, end by telling you this, okay? So this class is defined by... Well, it has to be an element of H2 of this line bundle. So by said duality, it's a linear functional on the said dual of this line bundle. So this is H n minus 2, if I'm in n dimensions, okay, of L dual tensor Kz, uh, no, Kx, the canonical bundle of X. Okay, so it should be a linear functional on this. So how do I take elements of this to C? What I do is, I, first I restrict to Z, because it's a linear functional that's defined as zero away from Z. So I restrict to Z. Okay. And then I remember how L was defined. This was defined to be something whose restriction to Z is the determinant of the normal bundle. So when I contract the determinant of the normal bundle with the canonical bundle, all the differential forms on X, I end up with the canonical bundle on Z. Okay, and this is in top degree because it was co-dimension two, so now I can just integrate. All right. So if and only if this condition holds, if and only if I can find a line bundle which extends the determinants of the normal bundle, and then this class in H2 of the line bundle is zero, then I can construct all of this data. Okay. Uh, so I've run out of time, so next time, I will give you an example of this just for five minutes. Um, and then I'm open to suggestions about what you want me to talk about. I can talk about essentially something completely different, which is what Simon was suggesting, which is um, counting of curves in Calabi out three folds using sheaf theory and its equivalence to Gromov Witten theory. Um, or I can talk about Simon has this project to understand how you can smooth reflexive sheaves. I don't fully understand it, but I could give some examples and talk a little bit about that, but I don't know what people have, what people wish to hear. Okay. Well, do people mind if I do a five-minute example? It'll be less than five minutes, actually. That's okay. All right. I mean, feel free to leave. I won't be offended if you leave. Does that mean you do mind? Right. Okay, so an example would be uh, you take. Yeah, maybe I should switch these over. Okay, so an example would be you take two skew lines in P3, okay, so here's P3, and skew just means they don't intersect, there's enough room in P3 for that, okay, so uh, let me call them L1 and L2, so the normal bundle is um, O1 plus O1, that's the junction again, that's because they're cut out by two sections of O1. You take two hyperplanes and intersect them, and you get your line, okay? So you take two sections of O1, X and Y, say, and look at their common zero sets, and you get your line. All right. So in particular, the determinant of the normal bundle is uh, O2. Uh, maybe I wanted to dualize in what I was doing. So, so minus 2, okay, and this extends to O minus 2 on P3. Okay, now this has no H2. Uh, do I care about this or it's dual? It doesn't actually matter. But. Uh, this has no H2, okay? So you can compute the cohomology, sheaf cohomology of line bundles on projective space, it's very easy. And it only appears in dimensions zero and n. Okay, and it also has no H1. I guess I didn't tell you that the choices in this construction 
were governed by H1 of the line bundle, but let's not worry about that. So here there will be some uniqueness. Okay. So my Z, Z is this L1 union L2. Uh, this is zero. Okay. So I trivially get an extension. So I get a naught goes to L goes to E. I get this extension here. All right. So this bundle, and and this is locally free. So, so I get, and this map here from E to IZ, which is, includes in OX, okay, so this is a map from E to OX, so this is a contraction of a section, where sec S is a section of the dual bundle. Okay, so this S cuts out my Z. All right? And the reason for this example is you could ask, what happens now if I bring these two lines together? so that they intersect. Okay, give me a second, I'll just skew the board. As I bring these two together, so move Li together until they intersect. Then um, you might think this is a local complete intersection curve in a threefold, which is correct, and so it induces a bundle, which is also correct, but it's not the limit of these. So let me just show you why that is. So um, before I had a curve maybe, um, let's say, work in local coordinates on C3, this could be given by, you know, x equals 0 and z equals t, say. And this could be given by y equals 0 and z equals 0. So this is in the z equals t plane, whereas this is in the z equals 0 plane. And then I'm sort of tending t to 0 here. And then this is x, y equals 0 in the z equals 0 plane. All right? Well, let's see what happens in terms of ideal sheaves here. So the ideal sheaf of this thing is y and z. And then the ideal sheaf of this thing is x and z minus t. These are the functions which vanish on here. These are the functions which vanish on here. So the ideal sheaf of the union is the intersection. So the functions which vanish on both. And it turns out that's just the product because they're transverse. So it's just x times y, x times z, uh, y times z minus t, and z times z minus t. Okay, this is the ideal sheaf, or the local ideal, of this guy. And now I tend t to 0, and I'm just going to tend t to 0 in these generators. You usually can't do that, but in this case you can. Usually you won't get the full ideal in that way, but here you will, and you get this ideal. Okay? Sorry, this was t tends to 0. Whereas this ideal here is given by z equals 0 and xy equals 0. All right? And these are not the same ideal. So uh, this one is contained in this one, but it's not equal. And the reason is this is the ideal of a scheme which looks like this. It looks like xy equals 0, but it's got a little fat point sticking up out of the z plane. So this, this curve is in the z equals 0 plane, and this tiny little infinitesimal point is pointing out of the z plane in the direction that these two lines came together. So it just remembers how the lines came together. All right? So the reason is, this is not what's called a flat limit of these curves, because you've lost a point. When you glue these two points together, you need some kind of continuity in the limit. You need to, that extra point to be somewhere, and there it is. It sort of pops off like this. And then um, what this tells you in terms of those ideal sheaves is that uh, 
So from this, I can construct an extension as before, but something slightly goes wrong. The normal bundle has changed here. So here, the normal bundle is now O1 because of this Z, but this is quadratic. So this becomes plus O2. So because the normal bundle has changed, because that wedge 2 has changed, what you find is um, that, that my, my O minus 2 is not, uh, does not, right, which I used, is not an extension of wedge 2 and dual anymore. Okay? So uh, what this means is, so something goes slightly wrong in the construction. Um, you can construct this extension, but what happens is at the point, uh, it's not locally free. Something because this discrepancy between O minus 2 and this determinant here, which will be O minus 3, means something happens at that point, and you get um, a reflexive, what's called a reflexive sheaf, which just means the least type, the least singular type of sheaf imaginable, but still singular, which is singular at P. Okay? Whereas from this construction, by taking the limit of these vector bundles, from this we get a sheaf E, uh, which is not reflexive. Um, it's, it's rather singular at P. And it sits inside its double dual. So that's this reflexive sheaf here, E double dual. OK, so I dualize, I dualize again. Um, and this E sits inside that E. Um, and so what you find is that this one has third churn class equal to 2, which is essentially the third churn class of the structure sheaf of a point. That's the discrepancy in this, uh, in this picture. That's to do with this point and that one. 